Good morning. Again, that's a better response than announcements. Good job. We're waking up. We're waking up. Uh, today we're kicking off a new three-week series. So I it said that I was preaching today. I'm actually preaching the next three weeks. Uh, and if you looked at your bulletin, you'll see that the title of the sermon series is Fighting the Voices. Now, I'm not talking about the voices that you may or may not hear in your head. Uh, if you are hearing those voices, we have a counseling ministry and we would love to sit down and talk with you and help you out with what you're dealing with. But that's not what we're talking about today. Instead, over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about the outside voices that infiltrate uh, into our minds and into our thoughts from the world. Uh, how those are influencing the way we think about things and dictating how we live. Right? And we know that God's Word is our compass or our measuring stick when it comes to our worldview and how we should develop uh, the way we think and the way that we live. But oftentimes, I think that sometimes the outside voices can have a bigger influence in our lives than what we think. And so this week, on a broader sense, we're going to be talking, we're just going to be introducing that topic. Uh, but then over the next uh, two weeks, we'll hit specific topics that I believe we are particularly susceptible to as believers. Uh, so to start this off, and I don't see a lot of students in the room, but to start off the message, I'm actually going to do my best to polarize the room just a little bit, okay? Uh, just by saying one sentence. School starts Friday, right? So I don't know if you noticed, but all the parents in the room either started laughing or smiling, uh, like completely overjoyed, looked like they had a weight lifted up off their shoulders. My kids are going back to school. And then if you looked around, uh, you saw like Anthony started to cry a little bit. Uh, I, saw, I saw Olivia, she was tearing up a little bit back there. Uh, and teachers as well. Teachers, I think they start either tomorrow or Tuesday. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's yeah, Tuesday, says the teacher. Uh, yeah, sad days for those people, right? Sad days. I always loved, personally, I always loved going back to school uh, because it was like my schedule was laid out for me. You get up, go to school. Uh, whenever you're done with school, I was on the practice field. Whenever practice was over, I went home. I ate dinner. I did my homework, and I was in bed by like 9 or 9.30. Right? I was, I, and not because my parents told me to, I wanted to be in bed, that kind of thing. And it was repeat over and over and over again. I loved going back to school. I've been talking to these kids. They don't love going back to school. Uh, but it's a reality they have to face. And with that reality come challenges. Right? There's new challenges. There's several students in this room that, uh, or that will be in this room, in this building, that are going to a new school. Uh, whether it's uh, fifth graders going into sixth grade, eighth graders going into ninth grade, or just transferring schools altogether, that's a new challenge. Uh, there's new classes, so these students get used to their classes and their teachers from last year, and then they start a new year and they have new classes, uh, they have uh, new teachers, and just a different adjustment period. And, and all of these things can be exciting. They can be really, really good. But going back to school also brings about familiar challenges. Uh, and specifically, what we're going to talk about today is uh, cultural and environmental challenges. And, and the problem with them being familiar is that sometimes when things become familiar, they become normal. And when they, be, when they become normal, they become a part of us. They begin to infiltrate how we act and how we respond to things uh, and start to shape the way that we live because we see them as normal. And that's kind of what's happening today uh, in the passage we're studying today. We're going to be in Colossians 2. Uh, and in Colossians, that's sort of what's happening. It's not like the, the church of Colossae is going back to school and Paul is writing them a back-to-school letter. Uh, but they are, facing, they are facing several different what, they, what we term heresies uh, in their region. We're going to talk about all those things. Outside voices pressuring them. And, and Paul is writing them to be, to be on guard against them. Don't perceive them as being normal and don't let them change you, but to be on guard against them. And so we're going to actually be in Colossians 2, starting in verse 6. Uh, but before we stand up and read, I just want to lay a little bit of context of what's going on in Colossians. Okay? We need to know a few things about Colossians before we actually read the passage. And, and one of the first things we need to know is the nature of Paul's relationship with the Colossians. Paul does not have a personal relationship with the Colossians. Okay? Uh, Paul actually 
only has a personal relationship with Epaphras, and the rest of the Colossians are people that he has heard about their faith. Okay, we see in, in uh, Colossians 1.4, he says, We have heard of your faith. In Colossians 1.9, it says, Since the day we heard uh, uh, this, we haven't stopped praying for you. And so Paul has heard about their faith, but Paul doesn't know them. He's not built a relationship with them. Uh, in, in Acts, we see that none of his missionary journeys take him to Colossae. Most likely, it was Epaphras had been visiting Laodicea, heard Paul preach, got saved, built a relationship with Paul, moved back to Colossae, and planted a church there. Right? And so that's the only tie. And, and the point is, is that Paul had great concern toward these saints, even though he didn't know them. Right? And Paul loved all the saints and, concern, and was concerned for all the saints, regardless of the nature of his relationship. And we're going to talk about that at the very end here. The second thing we need to know is that the Colossian church was seemingly really healthy, right? Uh, from the greeting to the salutation, this whole letter is oozing with affection and praise for the people of Colossae. Uh, Paul, is, Paul talks about how great their faith is and the way that they're living, and he's so encouraged to hear about the faith that they have and how they're standing strong in the faith. And that's from beginning to end, Right? So we have no reason to believe that they're actually being influenced by these voices on the outside. But Paul's writing this letter to warn them because it's important to know. It's important to know what we're facing because if we don't even know that we're in a battle, then that's when we start to lose the battle. And so Paul is writing this letter to them, uh, to this healthy church, to try and keep them healthy. And, and finally, the occasion of the letter, I've alluded to it several times, but uh, the church in Colossae was becoming increasingly surrounded by people who were pushing a philosophy that became known as the Colossian heresy. Okay? Groups in Colossae began to believe that all physical matter was evil. And this actually stemmed from how they interpreted Scripture. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall of, the fall of Adam and Eve. And God curses Adam and Eve, and then he curses all of creation. And in doing so, these people believed that all physical matter has to be evil because it's been cursed by God. So they start teaching this. And the problem with that is, is that's contradictory to the gospel. Because what they, what they start to believe is that there's no way that Jesus came in a physical body and died and resurrected because if Jesus would have come in a physical body, he too would have been evil, and then he couldn't have, he couldn't have possibly been good enough to die for our sins. So Jesus doesn't die, Jesus doesn't resurrect, and the problem with that is that if Jesus didn't die and Jesus didn't resurrect, then he didn't atone for our sins, and we still, we still have to pay the penalty for our sins, right? And so it's just skewing the gospel. Other things that they started to promote uh, was asceticism, or the deprivation of the body. Again, the body's evil, so they, de- they deprive the body of pleasures and physical needs, which that goes against Scripture as well. We're supposed to take care of our bodies. They, uh, again, worshiping spiritual things, uh, they, they believe that the worship of angels was appropriate as well. Several other heresies went into this Colossian heresy, and it was being pushed on the people of Colossae, and Paul was concerned. These things prompted Paul to write this letter in order to remind them of the gospel of Jesus and remind them that there was a battle to fight. Even though you're healthy, there's still a battle to fight, and you need to keep fighting it. Okay? And that's what brings us to our passage today. So if you get to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, and you stand with me as we read God's Word. Uh, John MacArthur calls this the heart of the epistle. It's the heart of the epistle, and, and in it, uh, Paul addresses these heresies and confronts them with the truth. So we're going to start, we're going to read in verse 6. It says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Let your roots grow down into Him, and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. 
Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as the body today and just lift up your name through song and through offering and through word, uh, through prayer. God, God, we pray that you would be here today with us, that, you, that your spirit would move. Uh, God, that we would not be a lifeless church, but a church that is seeking to grow. God, I pray that you would prepare us for the battle that's at hand, that you would make us aware that there's a battle at hand. Um, and God, that we would uh, be constantly on guard using your word to fight against the voices of this world. So God, as I, as I uh, preach these words, I pray that you would speak through me and that you would challenge us. Uh, specifically today as we talk uh, specific context, I pray that you would challenge us uh, to help protect the young people uh, in our congregation and in our community uh, and help them do battle as well. And so God, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that they would uh, hear the gospel truth and they'd come to know you and we get to celebrate new life today as well. God, please bless the rest of our service. It's your name I pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, so we started in verse 6, but we're going to skip verse 6 and 7. We're going to come back to them uh, toward the end, so just hang on tight there. We're actually going to start in verse 8. And the first command that I want us to notice is that Paul says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies or high-sounding nonsense, right? Don't be captured. Our our, our first point today is is, uh, not to be taken captive. Don't be taken captive. Are we going... Can I reach it? I'm supposed to say, don't be taken captive. I don't have a PowerPoint person. Somebody help me out. It's not working. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Good catch. Uh, don't be taken captive. Uh, Paul warns the Colossians not to be captured by the things that are being taught around them. Uh, the phrase that he uses literally means to be taken captive or to be kidnapped away from something good and taken towards something bad. Right? So he's giving the picture of them being taken from their healthy state as a healthy church and being carried away by this heresy that is being taught around them. Paul's concern is that the voices would penetrate, that are penetrating their region might harm their faith, especially if they are not on guard against it. And my concern is that we, we let this happen to us without even noticing that this happens to us far more than what we even notice or believe that it is happening. There's two main ways in which we can be carried away by philosophy, and w- one of the main ways is, is heretical teaching. So don't be taken by heretical teaching. Um, we face these things all the time, and again, this is our back-to-school Sunday. Uh, school kicks off this week, and so this is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically been termed back-to-school Sunday. And so I'm going to be talking in the context of school, of going back to school, and so I'm talking about scenarios that happen with our kids, but this is for everybody. This is for everybody today. One, it's for us to know as adults what our kids are going through, uh, what they're being faced with, what they're being challenged with, but two, uh, this applies to us. There are things out there, there are voices out there that are trying to penetrate our lives as well. So, heretical teachings. Regardless of if your students go to public school, Christian school, or homeschooled, whatever it might be, your students are being faced with teachings that need to be measured by the Word of God. Here's some examples. There are things that are explicitly taught at school uh, that go against God's Word, and one of them are students are hearing that they should deny God's Word because creationism isn't true. One of the big things that's, being, that's been pushed for a long time now is evolution, right? Big Bang Theory, evolution, uh, everything started with a monster explosion, uh, and we actually evolved from apes, monkeys, whatever, uh, and they, they invo- evolved from whatever, 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 all the way back down to this bacteria that crawled out of the ocean and, and evolved, right? And that's how we started. And so, uh, actually, the earth is millions or billions of years old, and... What's said in Genesis chapter 1 cannot be true. God did not create the earth in six days or create everything in six days and rest on the seventh. Uh, He did not create Adam from the dust of the earth and then Eve from Adam's uh, rib. None of that's true. 
because science says that it's not true. Our theories say that it's not true. That's, that's what's being taught. I'm not saying that that's not true, uh, but that's what's being taught. Or they're being taught that they should deny God's word because science and the Bible cannot coexist. This is, this is something uh, that even Christians believe. Uh, and Christians say, well, yeah, science and the Bible can't coexist, so whatever science says is garbage. And I'm just going to hold tightly to the Bible. And the Bible is true, and it is our measuring stick. But guess what? God created everything, so God created science. And so actually, science often supports uh, what God's Word says. Right? Another thing that's being taught, and this is more upper-level stuff, uh, high school and into college, is that logic explains everything and nothing supernatural actually exists. Right? This is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson removed uh, all supernatural activity from his Bible. So it basically just became a, a book of ethical living, right? of morality. So Jesus was not born of a virgin, because that's supernatural. That could not possibly have happened. Uh, Jesus did not heal or did not feed 5,000. Uh, Jesus did not heal anybody. Uh, Jesus did not die and resurrect. All of those things were, were supernatural, so they didn't actually happen. Right? Logic and supernatural cannot exist, and even it's being taught that if you believe the myths of the ancient Bible then you are a fool and you cannot possibly be educated, right? And that's what's being taught. And let me tell you again, let me reiterate that no matter where your students go to school, they're going to be introduced to these topics because they're going to interact with other students that are. Or, or that's just what the world is teaching. Regardless of what they learn in their classroom or in their home, these are ideas that are going to be taught to them. And unfortunately, many students have been carried away by these accusations, and it only gets worse when they get to college. It only gets worse. Here's the thing, too. What's taught in schools is not the biggest attack against the gospel. It's not the biggest attack against the, against the gospel. A big reason why all students and their parents need to be on, uh, on alert, regardless of the venue of where their child is being educated, is because most education doesn't happen in the schools Rather, it happens through TV shows, music, social media, interactions with their friends, right? So, so while your student or my student, whatever, might go to a Christian school, while they're sitting at lunch outside of their Christian classroom, they're interacting with other students that are being taught other things from other TV shows or music or social media, what they're seeing on the Internet, and now they're being educated by their friends that were educated by another source, and there's no protection for them, right? So what are some things that are being taught by the world? These are just truths that I know are being taught and I want to make you aware of. They're not necessarily to get a reaction, but I hope, that you, I hope this isn't surprising to you. Young women are being taught that their value comes from the way that they look, specifically how they dress, right? Right? And so we, they see, they see these, these women on TV shows and even, even young women on TV shows uh, dressed in such a way that shows off uh, the, the development that has taken place with them. And so young women are doing the same thing because that's what they see and, and they're valued by the way that they look. And so as they develop, they start to show off these features that, that God has given them in a way that was not intended, right? Right? Young women are being taught that being sexually intimate is the same as being showered with affection. Right? We see this on TV shows. That, that in order to be loved, in order to feel love, I've I got to go find a boyfriend. And then, and then when my boyfriend wants to do things physically with me, that's him showing me that he loves me. And that's not true. They're being taught that being catty and tearing down others behind their backs is funny and satisfying. That being gossipy. Right? And making others look bad so that I look better is the appropriate thing to do. And that's just, that's just what we do. Right? Young men are being taught to devalue women and see them as objects to be conquered rather than things to be cherished and respected. Again, same TV shows and movies and music, whatever it is, that shows these women uh, dressed the way that they're being dressed are showing men that are going after these women and just seeing them as conquests. So whether it's on TV or on the computer, through pornographic material, whatever it might be, uh, these young men are being taught that women are just objects. They're not actually human beings. 
They're just objects meant to fulfill their own personal pleasures. Young men are being taught to handle problems by either being physically aggressive. Okay, a problem arises, it comes up. Uh, We're supposed to fight this out. Or by fleeing, by running away, instead of being gracious and having uh, conversations and, and experiencing forgiveness with one another. Being the macho man and handling it a different way. Uh, young men are being taught that alcoholism is the norm, that experimental drugs are exciting to try. And that's just, that's just the way of life. That's just what you do when you're in high school. There are TV shows. It is alarming the amount of seemingly acceptable substance usage on some of these TV shows that, have, that are targeted toward high school students. And that's just, that's just normal. So why wouldn't we expect our students to be a part of, of parties and everything else where that goes on? Because they see it as normal. Uh, when I was in high school, it was an example of, of just being educated by, by not even our parents or what we are seeing in the classroom, but by the world. When I was in high school, I remember specifically, I was sitting at a banquet table. It was, our, it was my junior year finish the baseball season, we're having our end-of-year banquet, getting ready to go into summer. I'm sitting at the players' table, right? And all of, all of these guys that I played baseball with, that I grew up with my entire life, uh, I know their parents. Their parents aren't crummy people, right? They're not, they're not the worst human beings in the world. They might not all be saved, uh, but they, they weren't terrible people. I'm sitting there with, with these guys, and they begin to have a conversation. They're making up a summer game, and in this summer game, they were actually assigning point values to things that they accomplished physically with females during the summer. And the more, uh, the more ladies, the better was, was their goal. Again, they didn't learn that from their parents. Their parents didn't teach them this, but that's what they were doing. What's alarming to me is I'm not that old, but I've not been in school for a long time. And I can't imagine that it's gotten any better. I, I can only perceive that it's maybe gotten worse. So this is what our kids are facing. Paul warns, Don't let anyone capture you with the empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking. We must be on guard against these teachings, especially in our homes. We have to be aware of this so we can help our, our, help our teenagers confront those things, right, and fight against those things. The second thing is, uh, don't be taken by worldly traditions, right? So we've got heretical teachings that happen in, multi, uh, in multiple different ways, multiple different venues, but uh, also worldly traditions. Jesus uh, warned his followers relentlessly about being pulled from the truth by traditions, right? In Mark 7, 8, he, said, he was speaking to the Pharisees, and he said, for you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Uh, so, so these guys, uh, these guys were disregarding God's Word and were perpetuating a tradition that they had created that they thought was was the best way to worship, and in actually doing so, they were robbing from God's truth. Right? They were telling people what to eat and drink and when to do so and how to observe the Sabbath and everything else, adding to God's original word. We can have some of these. We can have a legalistic type push. Uh, in our traditions, but we've, we've talked about those quite a bit, and uh, this is more toward the students, and so, uh, again, for the adults, but targeting back to school time. So uh, we're going to talk about rites of passage. And so what's alarming is what we see is, even, even if it's not good, and we acknowledge that it's not good, if it's a tradition, if it's a rite of passage, then it's okay for this once. And so I went to Cedarville University. I went to a, a Christian college and what was shocking to me was sitting around, uh, living in a guy's dorm, sitting around and hearing stories from these guys about their 21st birthday. Right? Cedarville it w- is a dry college. There's no alcohol consumption, let alone drunkenness. And, and we all agree that drunkenness is sin, but yet on your 21st birthday, it's what you do. It's tradition, right? You have your buddies take you to the bar and they, you know, get to choose what drinks you try first, and before you know it, you, you don't even remember the night. Traditions. Um, uh, one that's specific to around here uh, is senior week. A lot of times, 
uh, we have these, these kids that we shelter from, from all of these things, and then they graduate high school, and we let them go on, on trips because it's tradition. And what do they do on those trips? They, not all the time, but a lot of them go, go to the beach, and they participate in terrible things with their friends. What's tradition? Senior week is tradition. Um, uh, spring break's the same way. Well, it, it's just what you do on spring break. It doesn't have to be. The point is, is if we're not aware of what's going on, traditions and teachings and whatnot, uh, we will be influenced by our culture. Our cultural envi- environment influences us, especially if we're not aware of it. Okay? So what does Paul say the antidote is? Verses 6 and 7. Uh, be rooted in the faith. Uh, be rooted in Christ. Right? He says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Let your roots grow down into Him and let your lives be built on Him. It's all about Jesus, being rooted in Jesus. How do we do that? Uh, How do we do that? How do we fight against the voices and make sure that we stay rooted in Jesus, uh, in the faith? It's by gospel repetition. Again, so how, how, do we, how do we make sure, I'm going to prove to you here in just a second, that our environment certainly does have an impact on us. So how do we make sure that we aren't being influenced by our, our environment and our culture? It's through gospel repetition. Let me, let me uh, illustrate this for you. Raise your hand, same time, raise your hand, if you are a Marshall fan or a West Virginia University fan. Raise your hand. Either one, same time. Same time, either one. You like either one. Okay, a good bit of you. Okay, Raise your hand if you're a Buckeye fan. My wife, a couple others. Very good. You guys are helping me. Very good. You guys, the majority of you, have been influenced by what is propagated around you, right? Every store has WVU or Marshall. The TV has WVU or Marshall. You grew up with it. Your parents indoctrinated you in it. And that's just, that's your culture and your, your environment. You, you are familiar with WVU and Marshall, right? Emily and I have been here for seven years. August 1st. Seven years August 1st was my first day at the church. Uh, Emily and I got married seven years uh, August 27th, so it's like two weeks away, and so she came down after that. We've been here about seven years, a little over for me, and in those seven years, we have been in the same culture and environment as the rest of you all. Why are Emily and I not WVU or Marshall fans? Because you're brainwashed, slow learner, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to go with a different reason, Right? It's because Emily and I regularly expose ourselves to the gospel truth that the Buckeyes are just better, right? Like, that's something that we remind ourselves all the time, okay? I'm glad you guys laughed. I was hoping that seven years of relational equity would have given me a pass on that. Uh, But the the point is, is that in order to protect against the philosophies of this world that are contrary to the gospel— we need to regularly expose ourselves to the gospel and the teachings held in God's word, right? Now, yes, Emily and I brainwashed whatever you want to call it. Uh, we certainly, we love the Buckeyes, and so we're not going to be swayed one way or the other. Uh, but we, the point is, is we, we do. We watch them, and we follow the team, and we follow what's going on. And yes, I know what's going on with the Buckeyes right now. You don't have to tell me as we go through the line. Uh, I know what's going on, okay? Uh, but... We remind ourselves. And in the same way, we need to do that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? So it's no surprise that if that's the antidote, if that's what we need to do in order to keep from being influenced by the world, to fight against the voices of the world, that in this letter that Paul is writing to the Colossians for the same thing, he has recited the gospel no less than five times in the first three chapters. Right? Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says... For he has rescued us from the, dark, or from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 
verses 19 and 20, the same chapter. Uh, For God in all its fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him he reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Verses 20 uh, through 22 says, This includes you who were once far away from God. Uh, You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he also brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. In our passage today, verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Chapter 3, verse 1, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with, with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So Paul shares the gospel over and over again, just in this short letter. And what's neat is a lot of times they pass down these letters orally, right? And so they had to memorize this. So as they're being uh, surrounded by these voices, by this heresy that is, that is going, around, going on around them, Paul has equipped them with a letter that he knows they're going to try to memorize. And as they're memorizing it, they're going to say the gospel over and over and over again to themselves, repeating it to themselves, gospel repetition so they can be protected and fight against those voices and be reminded of what is true versus what is not true. Gospel repetition means that we should expose ourselves to the truth in God's word more than the heresies or outside voices of this world. Are we doing that more than what we're hearing those outside voices? If We have to do it multiple times a day, all day, in order for that to be the case. Chapter 3, Paul says, to set our minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. We cannot be overwhelmed with the things that the world is trying to teach us. And we have to have our mind always focused on the things of Christ. In a society where we're immersed in TV watching, music listening, uh, neither of which is inherently evil, but it's how much of it and what you're putting in. The voice of the gospel is often drowned out by the voices of this world. I pray that it's not. So students, quickly as we finish, Pastor David preached about the full armor of God last week. And I pray that students, that you put on the full armor of God, live aware of the dangers and and put that on daily in order to do battle, right? We need to be aware and we need to be ready to do battle. So arm yourselves. Read God's word. Be ready for battle. Fill yourselves with truth. Daily reminder of the gospel Daily Bible reading, daily prayer, seeking God's help in fighting the battle. It's not a battle that we will win on our own. It's only through God that we can do that. Engaging in Christ conversations. Right? We talked about this actually last week, last Wednesday. Engaging in Christ conversations, having good believing friends that you can discuss the things of the world according to the Bible with. So you're equipped for those when they come what the students are called to do. Parents, prepare your children. Parents, remind your children daily of the gospel uh, through Bible engagement. If we're not engaging our students daily about God's word, then we're failing. We need to be talking to them every single day about what God's word says. Number two, fight for and alongside your children. So what does it mean to fight for your children? It means to pray for your children. You go to battle by sitting before the throne and pleading on their behalf for God to protect them. You you do battle for them. You do it alongside your children. You engage them in worldview conversations, right? So as we're... As we're talking to them about God's word, we're engaging them in worldview conversations, uh, confronting the voices of the world with truth. So so that means that we're aware of what the world's teaching, some of the things that I talked about. So we're aware about what's being pushed on our children, 
And then we sit there with God's word and we say, that's not true, this is what God says is. And we talk to them about those things. Over and over and over again. We're preparing them, we're fighting alongside them, so that as they leave our homes and they go to their schools or they go to their practices or they they go off to college, whatever it might be, they've been equipped with the wisdom of God's word through your conversation and you are sitting there doing battle alongside them whenever these topics come up. They're ready because they know what God's word says. Now, everyone else in the room, because not everybody in here is a parent of a, of a young child or a parent at all. If Paul shows so much concern and affection for the people in Colossae, people, again, whom he's never even met, I urge you, have enough concern for the young people in the room, for the young people of this church, for the young people of this community, to go to battle with them against these false gospels. Teach them the one true gospel. Engage in those conversations with them. They don't have to be your child for you to, be, to protect them and equip them for what's around, to help them fight against the voices that they're hearing. God didn't just give us parents to do that. It's a huge responsibility for the parents. God gave us the church as well. And so it is the responsibility of the church to equip our children together. Okay? So that's what we need to do. For those of you that are not believers, we prayed for you to open up. Um, But I just want to say, those five sections that I read lay out the gospel very clearly. And if you do not believe in Jesus, then you are losing the battle. You are currently have lost the battle to the world because you have been influenced to believe something otherwise. And I pray that if God is, is working on your heart and he's helped you to understand that, yeah, things of this world are broken and you yourself are broken, and that you need Jesus, and that the only way that we can be reconciled to God or restored to him is through faith in Jesus and receiving forgiveness of our sins, repenting of the things that we've done, acknowledging that it only, forgiveness only comes through Christ, then... Uh, if that's something that you're working through, I pray that you come talk to me or you talk to somebody close to you. They know Jesus. They can talk to you through it. And then I pray that you would tell us because, uh, man, we want to celebrate new life with you. If, if you put your faith in Jesus and God saves your soul, we want to celebrate that with you. And so uh, I pray that you would not leave here today without having that conversation and letting us pray with you. Okay? But for the rest of us, man, we need to use the faith that we have, stay strong in the faith as the Colossians did, uh, and help equip our young people to do battle and be ready to do battle ourselves. Let's pray. God, I thank you again for this opportunity. I thank you for your word. Uh, It is true. And God, I just pray that... um, I just pray that we would become so aware of the fact that this world is is not good. God, this world is anything but good. Um, It is cursed. And there's a lot of bad things out there and that we need to be on guard against them. And God, we thank you that you've given us your word and you've given us the spirit. Those of us who are saved have the spirit to help do battle. Uh, And we thank you for doing battle for us, but we just pray that we would not be naive to the fact that there is a battle, but God, we pray that we would be ready and that we would fight, and that you would help us fight. And so, God, for these students, as they're getting ready to go back into school, um, I pray that they would be on guard, and that you would protect them. And not only that, that, that they would be a light to others to help make a dark place lighter through your son, Jesus. And God, as parents and adults in the room, I pray that we would take our responsibility seriously to, uh, to lead our students, to lead our children in such a way uh, that they are equipped And as they leave, God, they are missionaries leaving our homes to go do your work. God, for those that don't know you, I pray that that they would come to know you, that you'd save their souls and we get to celebrate with them today. uh, And that it's not something that they would ignore, uh, but it's something that uh, that they would be obedient to and that we can get excited with them. Uh, We love you and we thank you for the opportunity to worship this morning.
Amen.